as I think I've already said, was a, a mad dog Kantian. And Abram Stroll was a, a mad dog analytic ordinary language philosopher. And I was a mad dog scientific realist. But what the hell, you're playing golf, so you can talk about these things. And uh, I'll, I'll confess to Henry, I still love Kant. This book I've entitled Plato's Camera, maybe there's five references to Plato in there. There's probably 40 references to Kant. Because I love Kant, I think, almost as much as you did, Henry. But I wanted to naturalize it. I wanted a theory of the brain that would, as it were, give life to all of those wonderful things that uh, Kant said. Uh, you weren't remotely interested in that sort of an approach to Kant. Uh, and I, you probably still disagree on that, but you know, I'm going to mail you a copy of that book so you can judge for yourself. Those sorts of interactions uh, and others are part of the reason why it was so much fun being in this department. Uh, I haven't mentioned, and I could go on at some length, the contribution that the graduate students made to all of this. Um, graduate students are not a separate part of the intellectual activity of any department. Uh, they take our seminars, they look over our shoulders, they laugh behind our backs, they point at our uh, uh, foibles and our mistakes. Hi, a guy, welcome, <laughs> welcome. Uh, another face from the past, uh, a graduate student from uh, our first year here, I think, isn't that right, Michelle? You were a graduate student in, in 1984? Yeah, nice to see you again, dear. Uh, I've already told all the uh, raw secrets of the graduate students at that time, so you needn't fear being embarrassed. Uh, oh, good, right. Well. I mentioned uh, just a moment ago when I was addressing uh, Sweet Henry the impact that Kant still has on me. And Kant was curiously ascientific in his philosophy. It wasn't because he was an ascientific man. On the contrary, among uh, historical philosophers, he was uh, one of the most successful uh, scientists. It was Kant who realized that uh, the Milky Way is a galaxy, just like the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, he came up with the idea of island universes to explain these uh, nebula. Uh, by that time, he had telescopes that he could look up and see these things fairly clearly. And the night skies of Europe at that point were a lot darker than the skies in North America now. Uh, the Andromeda galaxy, just so you might, you might not appreciate this, that's that lovely spiral galaxy in the constellation Andromeda. What you don't appreciate is that you can see it with the naked eye on a moonless night, especially if you're in the Anza Borrego Desert or somewhere where there's no ambient light. And you might think, you squint and see this tiny little thing. Oh no, the Andromeda galaxy is two and a half degrees across. The moon is half a degree across. It is five times the diameter of the moon. And if you get into a really dark circumstance, you're sitting looking at this and you say, how did I go through my whole life and, and, and not see that before? That's the closest one to us. Kant figured out what they were. He also wrote uh, a very worthy book on the natural theory and history of the heavens. Did I get it right, Henry? Uh, and uh, it came up with a view that Laplace, the mathematician later, filled out mathematically uh, on the origin of the solar system, a uh, collapsing gas cloud, um, a very scientific guy. But he wasn't scientific in his uh, theory of how the mind worked. Um, he thought that the pure forms of intuition, the basic um, platform in which all sensory representations occur, he thought that that was innate and fixed, and um, he didn't have a biological explanation for it. Uh, uh, God did it. Similarly, for the pure concepts of the understanding, that was uh, fixed and settled, and you know, go ask God where that came from. Uh, but for those of us who are post-Darwin, for those of us who think both that Kant was roughly right, at least in certain ways, and that whatever subserves the Kantian mechanisms, it's got to be the brain, we start asking ourselves questions like, all right then, how does it really work? 
what uh, forms of intuition uh, do we find in humans? How do they differ from the possible forms of intuition we find in other creatures? Uh, can the forms of intuition, even in humans, change over time with learning? Can you come to see things differently, hear things differently, uh, feel things differently? Uh, some of us were a bit over enthusiastic and wanted to say, yes, we can. Uh, and what about the pure concepts of the understanding? What about uh, the background machinery of uh, cognition. After all, if you're going to make perceptual judgments, you need concepts to apply. And where do you get your concepts? Uh, nativism wasn't a very good theory of how we get our concepts. And the empiricist view of uh, simple, uh, simple uh, copies gotten in experience, that wasn't a very good idea either. And the neural network models that people were putting together in the early years of the interdisciplinary interactions on this campus began to suggest ways in which concepts, or rather conceptual frameworks as a whole, not one concept at a time, could slowly form in response to the structures that were discovered in experience. The nature of the learning being a matter of slow adjustment of the synaptic connections. Well, as I said, back in the mid-80s, we then had even us junior professors had access to computing resources that would allow us to make, first of all, very, very simple neural network models. And as time went on, and other people did it too, and you saw, oh, how did you do that? Oh, that was neat, maybe I can use that. And then you'd put it to some new. There was a slow gathering of uh, ever more sophisticated attempts to make neural networks do things like have sensory motor coordination, uh, very simple things at first, um, recognize faces uh, for a second, uh, learn to discriminate grammatical sentences from non-grammatical sentences, learn to do basic grade one arithmetic, like add uh, any two numbers, no matter how big they were, they could learn the recursive procedures of elementary arithmetic. And one could let one's imagination uh, run free, at least at the end of the day, when you were uh, home having a glass of Chardonnay uh, at the uh, end of a bunch of uh, complex lectures, and imagine what could it be that's going on inside brains, not just human brains, but animal brains, that allow them to recognize a conspecific gait uh, or a particular bird's characteristic flight or a French accent or recognize musical uh, pieces. There were even attempts, I remember, why am I forgetting the guy's name? Robert, Robert, it'll come to me. Uh, who trained a neural network on a whole bunch of, uh, they were Bach sonatas, and he was training the network to take as input a little Bach phrase, and then to construct the next three or four notes in a manner that was consistent with the whole of Bach's corpus. And of course, Bach's corpus is there. And he managed to train up uh, the network and then set it to produce music. I think I've even got the tape at home somewhere. It's uh, one of those old cassettes. You guys don't remember cassettes. Uh, but it's, uh, it's in my, uh, and he said, Paul, listen to this and tell me what you think. And I remember thinking, oh, that's Bach. It may have been Mozart, by the way. I may have mistold you the story. But I sort of recognized who it was. But I don't remember that particular cantata or sonata. Uh, but you'd listen to it, and on it would go. There were examples like this that sort of tumbled out of the cornucopia of this research every three weeks, something to make you marvel. Uh, I remember Terry Sanofsky uh, put together a neural network that would read aloud from text, uh, English text. This, this was a feat because, of course, English spelling is the most tangled, confused, stupid, um, spelling system on the planet because it's stolen so much from so many other languages. Uh, think of G-H uh, uh, or O-U-G-H as in bow, uh, slew, uh, 
Um, in order to know which phoneme a particular letter needs to be transformed to, if you're going to read something aloud, you need to know all of these possibilities. And uh, then you need to know uh, the surrounding letters. O-U-G-H. Oh, yes, we're into that special stuff here. What are the possibilities? The folks at, what was the name of the company? Somebody at MIT had written a program that would allow the blind people on the planet to put a book in a scanner. The electronic scanner would scan the graphemes that would put that into the computer program that I think it was five or six people it took two years to write the program to make the appropriate uh, transformation into a phoneme. And then it would put it out a microphone. And so the blind person could put the book in there and it would be read aloud to the blind person. Terry Sanofsky and his, uh, I think it was Lecky, uh, said, can we train a neural network to do this? Well, uh, make a long story short, yes. And in fact, it worked uh, almost as well as the um, devoted program. And it learned to do this, I think, in something less than 36 hours of learning time. They, uh, set the training to go on Friday night, came back Sunday morning, and the, the thing was performing. He even got on to uh, America's Morning Show. I forget. It wasn't Katie Couric at this time. This was uh, even before Katie. Uh, and he would um, uh, play a recording of this neural network uh, reading aloud. Uh, well, this is a computer scientist who came from physics. Uh, and made friends with some of the philosophers uh, in, in our department. I give you some of the flavor of what was going on at the time. Uh, it's <clears throat> a flavor that comes from my unique perspective. Other people in the department were happily doing this history, that history. Bob uh, Pippin was writing, he'd already written a book on Kant and was writing a book on Hegel. And, uh, all sorts of other things were going on at the same time. It was a zoo. It was a healthy and a happy zoo. And if we're going to draw methodological lessons, oh, wise and worthy chair, uh, for how to run a philosophy department, um, diversity, variance, uh, um, tolerating uh, madness, at least for short periods of time, uh, is a good thing to do, at least if the history of this particular department uh, is, any, uh, is any example. What's going to happen in the future? Well, let me talk again a bit about Pat and her recent passion for moral philosophy. Now, she doesn't approach it in the standard way that we learned as undergraduates to approach it. Um, I'm here going to quote the famous um, uh, Texas philosopher, why am I blocking on his name, uh, the, Solomon, Robert Solomon, who has had for the last 20 years one of the major undergraduate freshman philosophy texts called, I think it's just called Introducing Philosophy. And he's got sections on metaphysics and sections on philosophy of mind. It's, it must be about this thick, and of course it costs the earth. There's also a big section on moral philosophy. And the first sentence begins something like this. Morals is the study of rules that guide behavior. Sounds reasonable enough. Then the question is, OK, which rules are the right rules? And from where did they derive their authority? And that perspective and those questions define most of moral philosophy in the uh, 20th century and into the 21st. But it's possible that that very first sentence from Robert Solomon's book is a mistake. Morality may not be a set of rules. And a couple of things that might hint in that direction is the fact that there's lots of social creatures on the planets. Think of baboons and wolves and uh, lion prides and 
uh, whale pods and on and on.